This morning, turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Should be easy to find, I think. Genesis, chapter 1. We're going to read verses 26 through 28. Then flip over to chapter 2 and read a few verses there. As you're turning, I want to give great honor to my wife. I love my wife. She is my best friend. She is very beautiful. And I'm thankful for that. And I am thankful that she is willing to travel with me all over the world. That is not a little thing. That is not a little matter. That is a beautiful thing. It's not easy for a lady to be drugged all over the planet. But we do it for the name of the Lord Jesus. And he sends us to beautiful places, so I have no complaints. So we're very thankful to be here in Athens, Greece. We're thankful for our time that we spend in Singapore and everywhere else. In between. We've also been, I know many of you are from Baguio City. And I've been there. I've been there. My brother Banya is a great man of God. Got to go to Baguio. Wonderful place. All the Chow Kings and the Jolly Bees and all those wonderful places <laughs> to eat. And so, I just want you guys to know I've been to many of your homeland and it's just uh, it's great to meet you here. We all meet together here in this very international and beautiful city of Athens, Greece. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Sister Carol, thank you for your prayers today. Yes, you do a wonderful job of leading in prayer. Praying over the prayer request. What a beautiful thing. It was powerful. And it's true. The Lord does not like abused authority. We know that. That's an automatic thing. But there's another thing the Lord doesn't like. Abdicated authority. That's when you don't use the authority God has given you. And you walk away from it. Creates a vacuum in the earth. That the enemy fills with vice. The enemy fills it with evil. But we were made to occupy that seat of authority that God gave us in His name by His grace and mercy. And so I thought that was very, very timely, very powerful. Genesis 1, beginning with verse 26. The word of the Lord says this, Then God said, I love reading that, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, 
Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Flipping over to verse, uh, chapter 2, rather, verse 15. The word of the Lord goes on to say, and notice the pattern here. It's a very beautiful pattern of God's intended plan for His creation. What He created us to do in us and through us. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Turn to your neighbor and say, That's the first command. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. With the help of the Holy Ghost this morning, I want to speak to you on this topic. The unlikely step from stressing to blessing. The unlikely step from stressing to blessing. You put your Bibles down and lift your hands all over this tabernacle. Just lift your voices. Just lift your voices to the Lord. We worship you in this house, O living God. We ask you to anoint us with your unction that we may declare your word. Mighty God, we take dominion and authority over everything that hinders, over everything that oppresses, and we command it to flee before the power of your holy name. We pray you lose liberty in this house. Loose the hunger upon us. Mighty God, lose a revelation. Loose understanding. Loose that living water, O mighty God. We declare to this nation of Greece that that well spring forward, that the well of living water spring up, let it flow into this nation as never before, let it flow in these altars, Almighty God, by the power and authority of the name of Jesus our Christ. Loose that living water, O God, let it flow forth in this very sanctuary now, all in your name. We loose your people, O God. By the anointing of the Lord placed upon us, by your mercy and grace, we loose your people of God into blessing, into an overflow, into a release of God of your power and kingdom. Well, can you clap your hands one more time? Give me glory. Lord, that's good. Somebody let's enjoy it in the power of the Lord when fill out. Jesus name. Yes, God. Lord, Gabriel told, you can be seated, thank you for standing for the reading of the Word of God. Gabriel told Daniel, I have come because of your words. He said, I have come to you because of the words you have spoken. When we speak the words of the Spirit, heavenly host, angels, come and minister to us. And fight for us. Yes. It is an absolute in the word of God. That's why it's imperative that when we come together, we speak. We declare. We speak in tongues. And then we pray in the spirit. And as the word of God is going forth, when you hear something that you want to connect to, you open your mouth and say, that's a good word. I receive that in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want that for my life. You have to reach out and reach up. As the word of God is going out and forward, you have to reach out with your voice, with your words. And that is the connection that I make to the spirit realm. And so at any point in the service you need something from God, like blind Bartimaeus, you have to speak. If Bartimaeus doesn't speak, he stays blind. But that day he walked away seeing. He walked away healed and completely whole because he loosed his voice and cried, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. Don't pass me by. Don't leave me in my state of blindness. Don't leave me in my state of infirmity. But God, stop right here and touch me by the power of your holy name. I don't know about you, but I want to cry out to the Lord God today. I want Him not to pass me by. 
I need him to touch me. I need him to touch this city. We need him to come and abide and dwell among us for the glory of his name. We can look at this passage in Genesis. First impressions are very important, are they not? It's very difficult to overcome a negative first impression. I'm trying to discern if this is my handkerchief. I think it is. If it is not, I apologize. If it is yours, I will buy you another. I am in need of it. First impressions really set the stage for the relationship to come. It can be very difficult to overcome a negative one. It's also very difficult to overcome a positive one. If you have a good first impression of someone, or of a restaurant, or cafe, or a place, it's a good thing. You usually think highly of it for the rest of your life. Now, when we're looking at the initial interaction between God and man, we can learn a lot from this relationship by these initial interactions. The words that are exchanged and God's intention for man. As soon as God created man, he blessed him. That was his will. He wanted to create us to bless us. We find here in Genesis 1, 26-28, he says, let us make man in our own image. Why is God talking to the angels? Why is he counseling with the angels before making humanity? To show us that before you do something big, you need to talk to somebody. You need counsel. So he counseled himself with lower beings to show us who are about to be created and set the precedent that when we go into something big, a big decision in our life, we need the counsel with people. There's safety in the multitude of counsel. But the well-advised, there is wisdom. Over and over in the Word of God, we see this. I can't just go out and do something very rashly. I need to talk to people about it. And so God, from the very beginning, is setting some very powerful principles in place for his creation called man. And he proves that this relationship between God and man is not about restriction, but it is about release into blessing and divine provision. That's what it's about. Before we read this, if I were to ask you what was the first commandment from God to man, I'm willing to bet that most of us would have said that thou shalt not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That would have been our initial response and impulse is to say that it was a restriction. Because in our fallen nature, our flesh we look at this relationship as restrictive. But that's not the reality of this relationship at all. This relationship we get to have between our Creator is very much about release and being blessed. It's about obeying His Word and being blessed because I obey His Word. It's about walking with Him and walking into the blessing He has for me as I do my best to obey what He has asked me to do. Amen. Obedience is a direction. It is not perfection. God wants us to stay the path. And when I make a mistake, I repent and I get back on the path as quickly as I can. We are not perfect. We make mistakes from time to time. But obedience unto God does not mean I'm perfect, because I'm not. It means I am heading the direction that He wants me to go. And as soon as I take a step off to the side, and He rebukes me, and He corrects me because He corrects those that He loves, as soon as I make a mistake, I repent like David did, made a horrible mistake, he repented, and he turned back to God. And the Bible says he died blameless in the law. Amen. Didn't say he was perfect. He said he died blameless. Because obedience is a direction. It is not perfection. So look at the interaction between God and man. He created us. As soon as we're created, He's blessing us. And He's commanding us to be fruitful and to multiply. 
which is a blessing. Family is his idea. It is his will. Children are a blessing from God. And the parents say amen. amen. Children are a blessing from God. So as soon as we're created, we are commanded. The context of creation is a commandment to be blessed, to be obedient, and to be fruitful, and to expand, and to multiply. That is the will of God for your life. You don't have to fast 40 days to figure that out. It is the will of God for you to be blessed. It is the will of God for you to be expanded. It is the will of God for you to be fruitful. It is the will of God for this church to multiply. Not just grow, but to multiply. That is the word and will of our God. Can you say amen? It's not about restriction. In any sense, it's about release. He tells him, he puts him in the garden. He says, tend and keep, protect and partake. So if I tend and keep, and I keep up the perimeter, there was a hedge around the Garden of Eden. There was a hedge of thorns, completely encircling Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden in Hebrew. Completely encompassed the entire thing. Adam's job, and I said this before nine months ago in December when I was here, Adam's job was to keep the hedge in place. Keep it protected. Keep your wife, keep your family, keep your atmosphere protected from what's beyond the garden and in the field. And we know what was in the field. There was a serpent in the field. There was a liar in the field. There was a deceiver in the field. We're very aware, aware of that. Adam was aware of that. It was not a surprise attack to him. He knew the serpent was there because he named the serpent. The serpent couldn't have gotten a name from any other place but Adam. So Adam knew he was there. He was aware of that. And God is telling him, son, if you will protect what I have given you, if you will obey my word, you can enjoy the blessings of my kingdom. I will pour out more blessing on you than you can possibly contain. If you will just but keep my word and trust me. Amen. Trust is very deep. Trust is when faith bears fruit. The fruitfulness of faith is trusting God. And my trust is proven when I don't understand what God is doing. That is when I truly can prove to Him that I trust Him. Adam did not understand, in all his brilliance, and he was very brilliant, but he did not understand why he could eat of every tree in the immensity of the garden, and the beauty of the garden, trees that produce fruit by and of themselves, there were bread trees in the garden. Bread just grew on them. So you'd go to the croissant tree and get a croissant. Or the bagel tree and get a bagel. And so these things are just hanging off the limbs of trees. Bread. It's amazing. That's why part of the curse was you have to make bread now by the sweat of your brow. Because before it was just hanging on a tree. Now you have to make it with the sweat of your brow. And so... God is telling him, you can enjoy all of this, but it doesn't make sense to him why I can eat all of this fruit, but yet this one tree that looks exactly like all the others, I can't eat it. You can't explain that analytically. It doesn't make sense to the human mind, to the human intellect. What God is wanting him to do is prove, Adam, that you trust me by obeying me when you do not understand me. That produces great trust and a deeper release of blessing from God when I prove to him that in a stressful state, when my mind is conflicted, when I do not understand what it is you are doing, yet I know this, God, I trust you. Because error is impossible with you. You have never led me astray. You will never leave me. You will never forsake me. You are always right. And I submit my level of brilliance to your ultimate level of brilliance. And you can trust in that. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If God can roll out the stars in the universe and set their course and set their alignment and have it all be perfect, how massive that is, how large and immense that is, 
Do you know that you can fit our planet Earth in the size and the mass of the sun one million times? One million times the Earth will fit into the sun. That's how big the sun is. The sun is an average star. It's one of the smaller. It's on the smaller end of average. And there are billions and trillions, innumerable hosts of heaven that God created by the power of the spoken word. All of them are connected to each other. All of them orbit. All of them have a pattern and design. All of them move through space guided by the hand of God. If he can do all of that, I promise you, he can guide you in the path of your life. Amen. He will not forsake you. He has not forgotten you. He knows where you are right now. His plan has always been to abundantly bless His people. The first commandment was not a restriction. The first commandment was enjoy the fruit. Enjoy the blessing. Partake of what I have provided for you. In prayer today in the office this morning, the Lord began to deal with my heart, speak to my spirit, and give me this phrase. This phrase came to me in prayer so powerful. Our response today determines our release. Our response determines our release. If you want to be released from doubt, from fear, from anxiety, from infirmity, from a lack of faith, from a lack of trust, your response today will determine the magnitude of your release. If you will respond to the Word of God, I can promise you this, God will release you from everything that is binding you. Yes. Everything that is putting a damper on your destiny, God will give you insight and clarity that you've not known. There is living water flowing in this place right now. It's healing water. It's liberating water. It is releasing water. And all you have to do is get in it to be made whole. That's all you have to do. The water troubler is troubling the waters of the Spirit in this sanctuary today. By His Word and for His glory, He is doing it. Our response to that will determine our release from the things that bind us. The words we speak, we said it at the very beginning. The words we speak connect us to the supernatural. The word for letter in Hebrew literally means connected to the supernatural. Connected to the power of God. In Hebrew, behaviors and words are inseparable. The word of God says, God remembered Noah and dried up the waters. He didn't just remember, oh yeah, I've got a guy in a boat over there with his family. A bunch of animals floating around for a long time. He didn't just think of him. In Hebrew, when you do something, when you say something, when you think something, there is a behavior, there is an action. The language is alive. There is an action that is associated with it. It's very powerful. So when God remembered Noah, he did something for him. He tried up the waters for him to go forth and to multiply and to be blessed. So when I speak words to connect myself to God... I have to put a behavior with it. I have to put, if you will, legs on my faith so that I can connect to something. I have to step out and see. I have to step into that living water that is flowing. I have to try Him to see. And if you try Him, if you taste it, you will see that the Lord God, He is good. Can you say amen? amen. God has a prophetic process. And a pattern that he always unfolds and uses for every life, everywhere. The patterns and processes are different from person to person. And this is why God told Peter. When Peter asked about John and John's destiny, Jesus tells Peter, don't worry about him. What if I want him to stay alive and remain until I come back the second time? What is that to you? He said, you follow me. I have a path for you. You can't understand John's path. You can only walk yours, because they're different. Peter could have never understood why John gets to die of old age, but Peter gets crucified upside down. They couldn't have understood that. 
And so what God is, Jesus is wanting him to understand is you have to focus on your path. But there is a path and there is a process and there is a pattern for every individual. Amen. Where God leads you into your destiny. Look at the pattern of bread that the Lord God provided for his people. There's so much to learn coming out of Egypt into the promised land. There's so much that we can observe. There's so much that we can learn from this prophetic process and pattern that God had for his people. It very much applies to us today. Look at the bread alone that he provided for them. He said, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread. So we can look and learn a lot from the bread provided, the pattern that is exhibited. At first we have matzah. Matzah is the unleavened bread of affliction. It's the stressful part. It's exceedingly stressful. They didn't even have time to let their bread rise. They had to make it so fast under such stress and slavery and being subjugated to these Egyptian taskmasters. They didn't have time to let their bread rise. So matzah was the unleavened bread. It doesn't taste super good. It doesn't taste like a fluffy croissant. It can be very bitter. This is the bread that God commanded them to eat even on the way out of Egypt because they had to leave quickly. Didn't have time to sit around and let the bread rise. When God calls you out, He calls you out quickly. When God calls you out of Egypt, He makes a quick way. He does a quick work. And so, they're eating this matzah. And then it transitions from matzah to manna. That just appears on the surface of the grass. And when it appeared, they didn't even understand it because manna means what? What is this? I don't even know what this is. What is this? That's literally what manna means. And so it appeared for them, but it was sweet. And it was good. And it was always enough. And I'm guessing it was a lot better than matzo. Probably tasted much, much better. We know it tasted better. And so it's from matzo to manna to the fruit of the land. The manna ceases. And then that day they eat the fruit of the land that year. Enough to put in storehouses. An overflowing, abundant amount. The fruit of the land. So much that they can now be a blessing to other people. And a blessing to other nations. As they eat the fruit of the land. So from matzah to manna to the fruit of the land. Notice and observe how the blessing gets progressively deeper. It gets better. It's very amazing. But it starts with matzah. It starts with stress. It starts with affliction. Why does God do that? Does God just want to cause us harm? No, not at all. He wants to teach us. He wants to put character in us. That's why Peter said, Don't think it's strange this fiery trial that has come upon you as if some strange thing has happened to you. But this is proving the genuineness of your faith. You have to go through the phases of matzah before I get to the manna and the fruit of the land. I have to prove myself in the stressful times before I enter into the blessed times. And so matzah, the bread, the natural process of this bread is to rise. All bread, its natural process is to rise due to carbon dioxide. This is what causes it to rise. But matzah teaches us to fight those fleshly inclinations. To rise up and be carnal. And so it teaches us we are to derive confidence. This matzah phase. We are to derive our confidence and our self-esteem. Not from outward compliments of people. Not from the outward accolades of the fashion industry or the world. But we are to derive our confidence and our value and our self-worth from what God has called us to be. And the calling of God that is upon us. And the blessings of God that He gives us. And the identity of God that we understand and know. This is where I find my value. It's intrinsically based on what I know of Him. It's not based on the external. It's not based on do I drive a Ferrari or not. It's not based on am I wearing Armani or Gucci or Prada or not. 
Those things are nice. They're great. But I don't get my value from those things. I get my value from what I know God has called me to be. I get my value from this. God is my God. I am called by His name. I am sanctified by His Spirit. He is guiding and ordering my steps. I have a relationship with Him. I am in covenant with Him. This is where I derive my confidence. And we are supposed to have confidence. Amen? You're supposed to have confidence. It's not a sin to have confidence. It's a sin to have pride, not confidence. It's a totally different thing. I'm confident in God. That's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ. He's not boasting. That's confidence. I can do all things in Him because I know it's Him and not me. And so I have confidence in the fact, I am sure of my calling, I am sure of the fact that whatever He asks me to do, He's going to make a way, He is going to provide, I stand in His authority, I stand here by His grace and mercy, and so I am confident in that fact, in that fact alone. I'm secure in Him. Amen. God doesn't want us to be walking around insecure. He doesn't want us to be walking around with our... Shoulders stooped and our head down. I'm an apostolic. Praise the Lord. Bless you. Thank you for having us. Good to be here. Shoulders stooped, head down. That's not how a child of God, a child of the King, walks, holds himself. You're supposed to have confidence. It's not humility to not have confidence. It's not humility at all. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And thinking of others first and knowing that my value comes from Him. This is what Matzah teaches us. There's no fluff. There's no puffiness. There's no hot air, if you will. You ever heard that expression, they're just full of hot air? Anyone ever heard that expression before? Maybe we just use that in America. They're just full of hot air. It means they're just very puffed up. They're very prideful. They're very shallow. They're very superficial. God is wanting us to know in this matzo phase, that's why we have to go through it, to get the puffiness of flesh and pride and arrogance out of our spirit. That's why we have to endure those situations. So that we learn to derive our confidence from Him. Manna was sweet. It could be baked into cakes. It met every need in the body. If you were dehydrated, if you were low on sodium and electrolytes, guess what the manna would do for you? Supernaturally, it would provide for you what your body is lacking every time. It would provide protein, nourishment, sustenance. To babies, it was like mother's milk. To toddlers, it was like mother's milk. It tasted and met the needs of your specific body. That's what they teach us about manna. It's powerful. But do you know what? It tasted bitter to those that were spiritually impure. If you read the account of those complaining, what do they say? We're tired of this manna. We're tired. It tastes bitter to us. You know why it tastes bitter? Because of your bad attitude. That's why it tastes bitter. If they would have prayed through... If they would have had a right attitude, it would have been sweet like honey. But manna, as soon as you put it in your mouth, your disposition affected the flavor and the needs it met in your body. That's how powerful it is. That's a wilderness thing. Manna only happens in the wilderness. After you've been called out of Egypt and you're wandering in the wilderness, blessed and beautiful things happen in the wilderness that don't happen anywhere else. Water comes from a rock. That rock follows you around to make sure you have plenty of water. That's amazing. That doesn't happen every day. I don't know about you, but there is no rock that follows me around to the streets of Athens that provides for water for me and my family whenever we need it. God could do it. Absolutely He could. But it doesn't happen. Because we can go get a bottle of water for a euro or less than that in any place. And so things happen in the wilderness that don't happen anywhere else. It's a powerful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And our family, one time we were traveling in Florida, and some farmers gave us some food. We didn't have very much money at all. We didn't have a lot of money to go buy food. Some farmers gave us some food, and for six weeks, I believe it was, that food, that, that produce, it was squash, and what else was it? Cabbage, other produce, it never spoiled. It never went bad. It stayed just as fresh as the first day it was picked. It never turned. That only happens 
in the wilderness. Amen. That is wilderness provision. Your clothes grow with you in the wilderness. That's what happened to them. A child that went into the wilderness at 12 left the wilderness. What's 40 plus 12? 52. Left the wilderness at 52 wearing the same outfit that he was wearing at 12. No holes, Sister Benu. And it grew with him. His shoes grew with him. That's amazing to me. That is wilderness level provision. That's the power of his holy provision. That's manna. That's the phase of manna. And then they enter the fruit of the land. Where now he can go out and he can buy as many outfits as he wants. Because he is walking into the fruit of the land. Notice how the progression gets deeper and better. And the blessing becomes more bountiful. And it increases exponentially. He puts me through stressing to lead me into blessing. That is the purpose. Because if he can't trust me with stressing, he can't trust me to handle my blessing. I'm going to say that again. If he can't trust me with stress, he cannot trust me to be blessed. That's where we prove how long we can dwell in the land of our destiny. Our reaction when the stress in the sun is hot on our brow. In the times of matzah, in the times of manna, what is our attitude? Are we thankful? Do we worship Him anyway? Do we trust Him implicitly? These things determine how long we dwell in the land of our destiny. If I can't wander for Him, W-A-N-D-E-R, if I can't wander for Him, trusting Him, then I'll never walk into His wonder, W-O-N-D-E-R. I have to be willing to wander to step into His wonder. That is the test of the wilderness. From the wilderness to the promised land. I have to go through the stress so that I can be blessed. There are many of you here tonight, you're wondering, or this morning, you're wondering and you're thinking, why do I have so much stress? Why am I going through so much? Why do I fight, it seems like, every day? Why do his people always have to fight? Why did Jacob, why was he born to an antagonistic brother named Esau that he would fight with from the womb almost to the last day of their life? Why is Israel fighting for their very existence today, right now? Why are they fighting for so much? Why does everything seem like it's a struggle? Because I have to go through stress to be blessed. And sometimes God allows me to be stressed so that I will turn back to Him. Do you know what Ishmael means? God will hear. That's what Ishmael means. God will hear. God will hear what? When the descendants of Ishmael attack Israel, they attack Israel when Israel is not obeying God. When they turn from Him, when they stop talking to Him, when they stop praying, when they stop observing His Word and the things He gave them to do, they turn from Him, they stop talking, and then God says, okay, I'm going to allow this to happen. I'm going to allow some stress to come upon you and your nation. I'm going to allow some bombs to fall down around you. And when Ishmael comes, then I will hear. I will hear you because you will turn back to me and you will pray. You will seek me. So God uses that to lead them into blessing. It's not Satan winning. It's God using Satan to accomplish his will. Because, and only because, God always has dominion over Satan. There is nothing Satan can ever do to win against the God that we serve. Absolutely nothing. So when he tries to stop the will of God, he ends up bringing about the will of God. And so God uses that, allows us to go through stress, allows us to go through things, because He wants to lead us into blessing. Amen. Look at the life of Joseph, and I'm coming to a close. Look at the life of Joseph and the prophetic process that he lived. 22 years, my friends. I've said this before, I can't get away from it here. God wants us to understand this. I know He wants me to understand it too. 22 years of stressing for 80 years of blessing. 
They'll never forget that. 22 years of stressing for 80 years of blessing. That's powerful. Amen. That's amazing to me. Joseph and his life fascinates and astonishes me every time I think about it. He had a few dreams from God to sustain him through 22 years of what he perceived to be going backwards. He did not have an annual camp meeting to attend. He did not have a homecoming like you guys will have soon. He didn't have that to go to and remember and have a preacher come up to him and prophesy and say, remember the dream, Joseph. You're great, Joseph. God's going to use you. He didn't have any of that. He had two dreams. He had his relationship with God. He had what he learned about Torah and the Word of God when he studied with his father. And that's it. He had his faith. He had his trust. And Joseph's trust has got to be one of the most incredibly beautiful manifestations of trust that has ever existed. For 22 years, being lied on and falsely accused and thrown in prison. It seemed like he was going back. One step, and another step, and another step. Until God says, now you're second in command of Egypt. Now you're second in command of the only superpower on the face of the planet. The only person above him was Pharaoh in Egypt. He was blessed, my friends. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of influence. He had multiple lands, multiple homes. He had any and everything he could have possibly wanted or imagined. He had two beautiful sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Had a wonderful family, a wonderful wife. He was blessed abundantly. Abundantly. So 22 years of stressing for 80 years of blessing. His process wasn't political. When he, had, when he tried to get out of his process, by political means, what happened to him? He tells the baker, the butler, remember me. Put in a good word for me. With your master. Maybe he can get me out of this mess. And what did God do? He caused them to forget him for two years. He said, I will add two years to your process because you thought you could get out by political wrangling. And politics didn't get you in here. And politics isn't going to get you out of here. You came in here by my word and you're coming out by my word. So just trust in my word. Because I'm going to establish you in blessing. So don't lean to politics. Don't lean to man's way, conventional wisdom. Just know that you're coming out of your stress by the word of the Lord. You are coming out, and when he sounds the alarm, and when he speaks with his mouth, there is nothing that can stop it. And Joseph was going to come out of that prison in his appointed time, and there is nothing that can stand in the way of that. Amen. Just like you are going to come out of your situation at the appointed time, and there is nothing that can get in the way of that. Amen. Say amen. amen. The unlikely step from stressing to blessing. If you can't trust me in the stress, then you can't trust me in the land of my destiny when I'm blessed. I have to exhibit that to God. I have to show that to Him. When Joseph arrived at his defining moment, face to face with his brothers, he could finally declare to them. They apologized. They said, we're sorry we sold you in slavery. Which I think was due. Apology was due. It was merited. His response to them is so telling. He says, you didn't sell me into slavery. He said, God sent me here ahead of you to save you. You know what Joseph is saying? I'm not a victim. So don't apologize to me. I don't believe in luck. I don't believe I got here because of bad luck. I don't believe I got here because you did something to me that is outside of God's control. I'm a vessel of the Lord. And He allowed me to go through this so that I could stand here today, second in command of the entire superpower of the earth. And I can save you in our vision. I can save you in the mystery of the mind, in the future and the hope of humanity. 
And he had the power and authority and abundance to do it because he exhibited great character through the time of stress. From matzah to manna to the fruit of the land. That's where God is taking us. God spoke to me and my wife this year and said, we are going to eat the fruit of the land. We're coming through a process. And we will continually be in a state of one process after another because we are not perfect. We are very much a work in progress. But the Lord has promised us we are about to eat the fruit of the land. And we receive that. I want you to receive that in this season for this church as well. For your life and your destiny, I want you to be willing to accept that God is going to bring forth the fruit of the land in this nation, in this church, and in your life. Well, if you receive it, can you clap your hands into the Lord? Well, if you shout the voice of Christ and say, God, I receive the blessing over my life. Yes. We're not victims in this house. We're vessels. We don't have a victim-minded mentality. We have the mentality of a vessel. Our steps are ordered. What a blessed perspective. What a powerful, incredible thing. We understand that the things in our life that seem so disconnected from our destiny will actually help us get to our destiny. Joseph didn't understand that during the process. It's very difficult to. He just knew to trust God. The foundation of sin is not trusting God when I don't understand God. That's the foundation of sin. Adam didn't trust him where he didn't understand him. In the domain he didn't understand, he couldn't exhibit enough trust to obey. And he took of the fruit, convinced of his wife, he was convinced of the serpent, they ate together, and they fell side by side. That's the foundation of sin. What Adam failed to do is know that everything in my life, everything I go through negative, it is preparing me for my destiny. That's why God allowed it. God doesn't do it just to be unkind. He doesn't do it to be cruel. He puts me through stress because He is leading me to blessing. And He wants me to be able to handle it when I get there. So that the land doesn't spit me out. But so that I can dwell there. Where Adam failed to make the connection is this. Adam blesses him. I mean, God blesses Adam. He creates him. And then he tells him something. He gets a great word from God. He says, it's not good for you to be alone. It's a good word. He says, I'm going to give you a wife. And all the single men say, that's a good word from God. I'm going to give him a wife. I'm glad God told me at 21 years of age. I have a wife. It's a beautiful thing. It's a blessing. It completes you. It really does. You can find the wife, find the good thing. It's a completion and so he tells him that. It's not good that you're alone. I'm going to give you a wife. Adam's like, okay, this is awesome. I'm going to get married now. And then God says, but first I want you to name all these animals. And Adam's thinking, what about the wife? I was getting married today. God said, no, you're going to the zoo today. I'm not getting married. You're going to name all these animals. Folks, that took a long time. To name all the animals of the earth. It took a while. He had to study them and name them according to their nature. That's how he named them. And so this took some time. Now during this he could have become very bitter. And said this has nothing to do with my destiny. Which is my wife. Which is Eve. This is, not, this is so disconnected from my destiny. Why am I here? This is random and this is pointless. But you know in Hebrew when you ask Why? You never can ask why. It's forbidden to ask why as if this is pointless. And this has no connection to my destiny. There's two ways to ask why in Hebrew. You say why, what part of my past has brought this about, or why, what part of my future is this preparing me for. You never throw your hands up and rend your garment and just say why, like this is pointless. It's sinful to do that. And so Adam missed the connection here. What is God doing? Sending him to the zoo when he's supposed to be at the altar getting married. What's the point? The point is this. The serpent told him. The serpent told his wife. 
you can be like the animals. If we see something we want, we take it. And you can be like that, and you won't die. You can transgress the Word of God and give in to your instincts. Let that bread just go ahead and rise up. That's what he's saying. Let those instincts take over, and if that fruit looks good to you, so what if God said? That's one interpretation in Hebrew of what the serpent said. So what if God said, if it looks good to you, do it. If it sounds good to you, go ahead. Now how is naming animals before his wife is created? How is that preparing him for that moment? Because in studying those animals, in naming them according to their nature, he understood, I am not an animal at all. I am alone in this world. There's nothing out there like me. I've named a horse. I've named an ape. I've named an elephant. I've named a tiger. I've named a lion. I've named all of these things. I've studied their nature. They're very much not like me. I'm alone. I'm not an animal. I can't react animalistically. I can't react just off of instinct. That job. And that's the thing. Women, don't ever marry a man that doesn't have a job. <laughs> Amen? Before Adam got Eve, he had to do a job. And he had to do it well. And it took skill. And it took focus. And it took attention. So don't ever marry someone that doesn't have a job. That's what God is teaching us. And so in all of that, he's supposed to learn, number one, my wife is going to complete me because there's nothing else out there like us. So he should have respected and loved her more. And he also should have been able to defeat this, the, the serpent and the serpent's message by saying, we're not animals in here. We don't just take something because we think it looks good. We have to obey the word of God. That's what we submit to. God was preparing him for that destiny moment. So nothing in your life is without purpose. There's nothing random. It's hard for us to get there. I'm still trying to get there fully, completely. I really am. But it's hard. It's difficult for us. We miss it. The smartest guy almost to ever live, Adam, but perfect genetics, perfect DNA, missed it. And so it's easy for us to miss it. It truly is. But you need to look at your life and say, I'm a vessel of God and if I'm going through stress, it's because God is going to bless me. And He wants me to be able to handle the blessing. And He's preparing me for something. He's allowed it to happen for a purpose. There is nothing God allows if you're surrendered to Him, if you're submitted to Him. There's nothing He allows in your life that is random. There is nothing He does that is devoid of purpose. Nothing. Everything is to connect you to something else. And so we have to learn those deeper lessons. Musicians, if you could come. This is a blessed perspective. This is the exact perspective Joseph had. He said there was nothing in my life that was just completely purposeless. Because I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim of random. I'm not a victim of your evil deeds that you did against me, performed against me. I'm not a victim of that. I'm above that. Because I serve a God that's above all. I serve a God that has created everything. And He loves me. And He told me I would have this destiny. And I'm going to have this destiny. Regardless of what it looks like right now, I know I am going toward the destiny God has declared I should experience and have. No matter what the circumstances may appear to be, I understand God loves me. God is for me. And my expected end is good. My present situation might not be very good, but my expected end is good. I may be in a matzah phase. I may be in a manna phase. But I know the fruit of the land is coming. Because I am obeying His word. And His word leads me into blessing. Leads me into blessing. We can stand together all over this house to this morning. I want us to end with worship. And I want us to remember worship is not about how I feel. Worship is about who He is. It's not even about what He's done for me. It's not about the feats of strength and power He's done in my life. Although He's done many, too many to tell. 
But worship's not about that. Praise is about that. Worship is about Him and Him alone. Worship is about being in awe of God and loving Him. And saying, God, if you never do anything else for me, which we know is impossible, but if you never do anything else for me, I'm going to worship you today with everything that I've got because you're worthy. Your very existence deserves my praise and worship. Your very existence deserves my best. I want to leave every Sunday with my feet hurting and my legs hurting. Because I want to give myself to Him. He gave His hands for me. He gave His feet for me. He gave His side for me. He took a crown of thorns upon His scalp. He had His beard ripped out by Roman soldiers. All for me. He suffered for me and you. He bled on a cross. He was mocked openly by the very people. He breathed life into their lungs. He did all that for me. Surely, I can leap for Him. I can dance for Him. I can lift my voice for Him. I can shout for Him. I can worship for Him. The Hebrew definition of a song is very interesting to me. This is how the Lord wanted me to end the service today. It is said in Israel that there are only ten songs in all of Scripture. Obviously, we know there are many more psalms and poetry. But only ten actual true songs are recorded in the scriptural period. Because they define a song very differently than we do. When the children of Israel were across the Sea of Reeds, and they had seen and witnessed the walls of the sea collapse and crush their enemy before their eyes. When they had that moment of clarity, there was a spark of divine understanding and revelation that came upon them. And they understood everything in their life was leading them up to that point. God allowed them to be slaves. God allowed them to eat the bread of affliction and slavery. He allowed them to go through certain things to bring about His glorious plan in their life. They realized there was nothing random. There was nothing pointless. There was nothing meaningless. Everything was to bring us to this point. All the pain, all of the stress was to bring us to this glorious point where we see and realize and have the spark of understanding that everything works together for the good to them that love and serve and walk with the Lord God. The Bible says they sang. That's the definition of a song. It is singing with the understanding that everything in my life is for His purpose and for His glory. That everything I've been through, God is bringing me to a blessed point where He is going to crush the enemy of my soul. And I am going to be delivered once and for all. I am going to walk on streets of gold. I am going to dance. Excuse me. I'm not going to walk. I'm going to dance on streets of gold. I'm going to run on streets of gold. I, there is coming a day when there will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. I am going to see him face to face. I'm going to worship with David. I'm going to worship with Joseph. I'm going to worship with Paul and James and Peter and above Else. I'm going to see my Jesus face to face. I'm going to bow before him. I'm going to throw my crown at his feet. And I am going to worship him forever. Not being tired in my body. Not having to eat. Not sweating. But with a glorified body. I'm going to worship the Lord for eternity. I know this day is coming. And when we sing, when we worship around these altars today, I want you to sing with that in mind. I want us to sing according to the Hebrew biblical definition of a song. Knowing that there is nothing pointless in my life. I'm not a victim. Yes, there's pain, but there's going to be more prosperity and blessing and peace than there is pain. Absolutely there is. Regardless of what it looks like right now, I'm going to worship knowing that my God is ordering my steps. And my expected end is good. 
And He created me to bless me. He created me to be fruitful. There's living water still flowing in this house this morning. I wonder if there's anybody out here today. I sense in the closing moments of this service.